Join me today for another exciting episode of Spinning My Wheels. Welcome back to those of you who've been here before. Welcome to those of you who are new to the channel. Uh, usually there's more than one of us on here. It's uh, a, a cabal of one is not much of a cabal. Uh, however, a couple of us uh, spend a lot of time on the road, so we have some of these videos where it's just kind of us driving around talking about stuff, uh, which is what this will be. Hence the Spinning My Wheels title. So today, I want to kind of talk about uh, anachronistic things in science fiction, uh, but also just kind of the way things used to be depicted in science fiction. We're talking like 60s, 70s, and probably into the 80s, kind of sci-fi. Uh, and what kind of brought this on was a discussion I was reading recently about the show Andor. And uh, someone was uh, pointing at there, there's, there's a moment towards the end. I'm going to try to say this as spoiler free as possible because the last episode hasn't been on air very long as I'm recording this. Uh, there comes a moment where several of the characters who are hoping to remain anonymous find themselves in a position where they're going to have a front row seat to the Empire doing its thing, uh, suppressing people. And someone brought up the fact that the person's taking a big risk because surely the Empire is just going to you know, videotape the whole thing and run everyone's faces against facial recognition software. And someone else pointed out that, well, uh, no, they're not, because we have no reason to believe such a thing exists in Star Wars. Because we've never seen it in action, there's times where it would have made sense to have it. And so it's one of these situations where we know that they can record things, because obviously a, a race that can, uh, an advanced technological society that can go from one side of the galaxy to the other, presumably has the ability to take pictures and video. But their computer technology is kind of wonky compared to ours because their computer technology is based on what everyone kind of thought future computer technology might be in 1977. So, there's things that, that we have that are more advanced than the Empire, but that's one, of the, that's one of the weird quirks, one of the weird appeals, and as much as I rag on the sequel trilogy, with one glaring exception, they stuck with this idea of, you know, the, the technology level of the Star Wars universe has been established. And just because real-world technology has surpassed it in some ways doesn't mean that we have to automatically update everything. So that was the thing I liked, like in The Force Awakens, you know, they're still using giant computer consoles with all kinds of switches and knobs and dials and all kinds of impractical things when in the real world you should probably just be able to, you know, do a couple keystrokes on a keyboard and boom, you're done. So, so I like that. You know, I like that they like that they kept that. Uh, the, the lone exception I'm mentioning is the hyperspace tracking thing, because that just breaks the setting. Because the whole point is, you jump to hyperspace, they can't track you. They can guess your known. They can guess your based on your trajectory. They can take a guess as to where you're going, but you're moving beyond the speed of light, okay, if any time at all elapses, they only have to be off by a degree or two, and they're going to be in some other system entirely because the vast distance is involved. 
So that's why the whole being able to escape to hyperspace is the important part of any chase in Star Wars. Like that's the goal, because you know once you're in hyperspace, you're golden. Because they can't reasonably track you. You know, unless you're like in the outer rim and there's only like two places you can go, one's to the right, one's to the left, and you went to the left, then, well, that's probably where you're going. You know, you get crafty and stop halfway and then turn around or something, but the point is, in general, it's insanely difficult to track things once they go to hyperspace, basically bordering on impossible. So suddenly reversing that was a, was a horrible idea from a narrative standpoint. And it's just it's one, of, one of many illustrations of someone just not thinking through the implications of the technological changes they were trying to bring to the setting, or just not understanding why certain things are the way they are, okay? So, so that aside, uh, you know, I, I like the fact that, you know, we look in, uh, you know, in, in show, you know, the Star Wars settings, yeah, they've got robots, but do we see fleets of, of armed drones everywhere? No. But why not? Like, you would think there would be, because there are battle droids. They do arm the robots. They can control lots of them all at once. All the pieces for the technology are there. They just don't use them, that, that, we, that we've seen. So, that, that's just little things like that. Um, you know, I like it. It's, it maintains a consistency. It's not trying to not trying to match the current thing. Unlike with the uh, uh, the Abrams Star Trek reboot, where all of a sudden the Enterprise looked a hell of a lot more advanced than it did in the original series. And there's not really a quick and easy explanation for why that should be, because it's still the same exact time frame. The singular difference being that that Romulan ship came through. And I know that they try to hang all the, the changes, they try to hang their hat on that thing, but no, that's, that's not a big enough shift in time to, to cause a radical design change like that in the Enterprise. I don't care. It's an alternate timeline. Still looks kind of cool, but doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. It was an attempt to update things based on how we know things are, you know, since we're no longer looking at the retro futurism of the 60s, you know, it's, it's we're, we're past that. So they're trying to update it to what we think the future is going to look like from our current perspective. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. I, uh, like I said, I personally prefer the, the other just because I guess that's what I'm used to, maybe. Uh, but also, I just think it, you know, it gives things a unique look. Alright? And it, it, it separates things, separates sci-fi from, uh, the more, like, the, the more dystopian kind of sci-fi, and, because, uh, you know, dystopian sci-fi usually looks like Blade Runner. It's like now, but crappier, with, with advanced technology, but everything looks like it's falling apart, and it rains a lot, and it's dark a lot, and so, and then that fits for a certain kind of storyline. For, for what Blade Runner is trying to go for, that fits just fine. You know, but I, I also like, I also like the fantastical, you know, the, the, the things that just, you know, aren't in line with reality. So that's why I like, you know, like the original Star Trek series or the Next Generation. You know, it's it's a it's a look at the future, potential future. I think it's a wildly optimistic look at the future, just to be clear, for Star Trek. Hell, but...
Star Wars, you know, you still have that that lived-in look, you know, that, that things are falling apart, but you can tell that things were way more advanced, you know. So, you know, I, I like that. Um, I like in, uh, you know, older movies, seeing the, the gigantic computer banks and just thinking to myself that, you know, my cell phone can accomplish more than that room full of computing power could, you know, I just, I think that's kind of hilarious. Uh, I think it's best exemplified in the movie Iron Sky, where there's a moment uh, where there's a, okay, it's going to require me to explain part of the plot to Iron Sky here. For those of you who have not heard of it or seen it, the basic idea is that before the end of World War II, a group of Nazis escaped and landed on the moon. Obviously, had rockets and stuff. Landed on the moon and built a base there, uh, such that the people on Earth cannot see it. It's, it's inside one of the craters. And I believe it's on the dark side. So they've been living up there ever since, and they've been building ships with the ultimate purpose of launching an attack on the Earth to continue, you know, the whole deal with the Third Reich and everything. So uh, the U.S. sends in a publicity stunt, sends some people up to the moon, and one of them is a, a model or, or something, uh, but, but he's, he's a black guy. The other astronauts get killed, but they take him prisoner, and then they're all surprised when they open up his helmet and see that it's a black guy, because, you know, they're, they're Nazis. So, um, and that, that plays a lot into some of the plot later on. So they're asking him what all the things are that he has with him, and uh, one of them is a cell phone, and it's like, it's a phone and a computer. And the scientist just starts laughing maniacally. He's like, oh, ho, 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 that's not a computer. And he turns behind him and there's this giant thing with all kinds of uh, magnetic tape reels and, and all kinds of wiring and switches and dials. And he's like, this is a computer. And uh, they have built this massive uh, super weapon called the Goto Damarung. And the problem is uh, the whole thing works, but it needs a stronger computer to control it. And so, like, a few minutes later in the movie, the scientist is giving a presentation. He's like, yes, yeah, so the Earthling brought this computer. So once he started looking at it, he realized the guy wasn't lying, that it was a computer. And, uh, and he's like, I believe with this, we, we have the computing power we need to actually launch the thing. And uh, he's like, I had to design this cable for it. And I don't remember what the abbreviate, I don't remember what, the, what they stood for. But instead of uh, Universal Serial Bus, it was something else, but it's still spelled USB. So he plugs it in, and, it, you know, the reactor's able to come online and everything. And so, at that point, like, they realize they need more, more of these and have more powerful ones. So some of them take one of their ships, which looks like a UFO, to go to Earth to get more computers to bring back to power up to go to a damn room. And uh, so then a lot of the plot happens. It's totally irrelevant to this little story here. And uh, it comes down to then the folks on the moon do launch the invasion. Uh, so a bunch of the UFOs come flying in. And even though they're advanced enough to fly through space and, and deal with the atmosphere, they still have manually sighted machine guns. And so, I mean, they can do a lot of damage to New York City, but like the F-15s and whatnot just chew them up because they're not fast and they're, you know, still using manually sighted machine guns as their primary weapon. Uh, so the fighters are able to repel them. Of course, then the then they begin the the meteor blitzkrieg. And they just start dropping meteorites and, uh, illustrate that you know you, you want to be the one that controls higher up in the gravity well if you're in that kind of fight. Uh, but ultimately, it involves a massive battle up in space where uh, the various nations turns out 
all their little satellites and chips and everything are all armed. And uh, so the U.S. leads the charge with the ship that was being built to go to Mars. It turns out it's laden with all kinds of nuclear weaponry. And so they mop up the, the smaller ships pretty easily. But then the Gododameron powers up. And it's massive beyond belief. So even though it's like this older technology, like you literally there's a giant mechanism in the middle of it that's rotating to power the whole thing. Uh, even though it's this more primitive technology, it's just on such a huge scale that the, the Earth ships can't do anything to it. And the weaponry it's packing is significantly more destructive uh, because it's uh, there's some kind of hydrogen-3 weapons. So, yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for, the, wasn't for the internal fight that occurs, the more advanced weapons would totally be destroyed by this thing. But, you know, that's what happens. So, it's, uh, the, the, so the whole, the movie has a, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of those just kind of weird, like, older technologies, like older computer systems and everything, but are somehow still strong enough to get the job done, and then the Goto Dameron is just, uh, just this massive war machine, stronger than anything they've got. So yeah, I just you know I seeing seeing ideas like that I, I, I love seeing those in movies and you know, TV shows so that's why I always get a kick out of a lot of the things in the original Star Trek series or, or older things in that vein you know you have people with their computer systems they're just these these giant you know room sized things all the magnetic tape reels and everything. Even have uh, even have a few custom Lego pieces I bought at a convention that uh, they're, they're tall, you know, flat plates, uh, bricks, but they've got uh, custom. Uh, I don't know if they're stickers or paint uh, to look like older computers like that with the tape reels and all the little lights and switches and everything. Because I think they go real well with the older classic space Legos, which for those of you who've never seen them, you should look at them sometime. Uh, there's just all kinds of crazy going on there. There's a lot of, you can see what they were going for with like, slightly, like they, like they looked at where the space program was, and they're like, okay, what's this going to be in 50 years, 100 years, and kind of extrapolated from that, but then added just like weird robot things here and there to it. So you, you wind up with a lot of kind of weird sets. There's a bunch of like rovers, little one-man ships. Or there's one thing that looks kind of like a giant humanoid that's supposed to be the robot command center. I assume it's the center where you command the robots, even though it looks like a giant robot. Because there's guys inside of it controlling it. Uh, so yeah. So things like that. That's, I don't know, that's probably probably has a lot to do with my interests in that area. Uh, not as much with like the Flash Gordon era, like the series, the, the older series. The movie, on the other hand, yes, definitely. But that's a case of someone with a much bigger budget trying to kind of, kind of put some shine and rep replicate an older idea and put some shine on it. That I'm down for. You know, so like I said, like I mentioned, the, the sequel trilogy for Star Wars. You know, even though they had this huge budget, they still made the computer controls and everything look like 1970s TV booth controls, which is what, like, the Death Star control room panels are. And uh, that's, like, the, that's, that's the pinnacle of Star Wars technology. Lots of switches and dials and knobs. And it's great. So you have a you have a uh, and it leads to other weird things too. Like in Rogue One, I don't know what the exact phrasing was, but I believe they said one of the reasons why they had to have the giant dish had to deal with like the size of the files they had to send out, 
and uh, I don't know enough about transmitting to know if that's even a thing. I don't think it is. As far as the dish size, right, the file size, I, I, I don't think it is, but I, I could be wildly wrong on that. However, the idea that you need a dish that huge to send the plans to the Death Star is ludicrous. I mean, the plans of the Death Star it could be compressed into a small enough file you can send it in an email. Now, okay, you're not even going to hit the you're not even going to hit the, the file size limit because there's nothing to it. It's a bunch of technical schematics. So I mean, there's a lot of pages, but so what? And this is in the same universe that you can send a real-time, three-dimensional holographic image from one side of the galaxy to the other. The amount of, like, like the bandwidth to send that, forget the real-time part, just the three-dimensional holographic part, that's tremendous. But then add in the real-time part, and you, you've got a, a signal that's capable of breaking the speed of light somehow, probably tunneling through hyperspace if I had to guess given it Star Wars. Okay, so somehow those two systems exist in the same setting. Doesn't make any sense, but it's great. You know, and likewise, once they get the files to the rebels, they're in Rogue One. You know, they're on a disc, like a, like a floppy disc, space floppy disc. So yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but for for whatever reason, I, I just I really like the aesthetic of all that stuff. Uh, so that's why you know you don't see it much anymore, obviously, because people try to make the future look like what we think the future is going to look like now, which makes sense because at the you know at the time that's what they were doing. It's just that you know technology's moved along in the real world, so. But now we have these franchises like Star Wars and Star Trek that have a distinct look and a distinct technological curve to them that you, if to, to really, to maintain cohesion, you have to stick with it. And I, just, I find that kind of interesting. This applies to uh, Battletech that we talk about on the channel here a lot too. You know, Battletech is very much how we thought things were going to be in the 80s, like in the future during the 80s. Like we did, <coughs> excuse me, we had not envisioned, you know, drone based warfare yet. So there's very few drone based weapons in uh, Battletech. On top of that, you're already being asked to believe that the pinnacle of war technology is a 30 foot tall robot. Something which any tank should be able to just drill easily because of its height. But, you know, for in universe reasons, that's not so simple. Uh, yeah, so you, you've got to deal with that. you got to deal with the fact that, again, computers are largely still like the big magnetic tape reel types. I'm sure is how it's depicted in the older artwork for Battletech because it's the future of the 80s. And that's what big computers in the 80s were. Not tons and tons of, uh, of smaller hard drives spinning around. Or not, as the case of solid state drives now. So that's how you have things in Battletech. How, like, aerospace doesn't just completely dominate the battlefield, even though it should. I mean, that should, that should have been a foregone conclusion in the 80s, also. But the game's about mechs, so they try to figure out, you know, they're trying to create in universe reasons why these things don't happen this way. And uh, they just have to try to remain consistent with that. But, you, know, you still have the, like I said, the giant computers in 
in fact, the way it's depicted on a number of planets is that there is like a, a or a series of master computers, and then you have like a like a terminal that grants access to it instead of you having a home computer. And there's actually a, there's actually a logic to that uh, from like the standpoint of a lot of these planets are not uh, not heavily settled, not heavily colonized. So, do you want to spend a bunch of resources on giving everyone their own home computers, which are going to need maintenance and repairs and like this, or are you going to have like a couple just stupidly rugged computers somewhere? probably buried in a bunker that can withstand a nuclear blast and then just give everyone a little more disposable terminals that grant them access uh, to, a ma to a master computer and servers and things like that you know from a, if you're if you're a colony that makes a lot more sense than everyone bringing you know than everyone bringing home computers and laptops and everything else with them. Now, on your more established worlds, like Earth, or, uh, you know, like the, like the Draconis capital, Luthien, or uh, Siam for the House, uh, House Lao, you know, on those worlds, well, maybe not Siam, maybe not Luthien, Actually, those might be the two not so great examples because of how strict their societies are. But worlds that are as technologically developed and as industrialized as those, it wouldn't be anything to see people have home computers instead of relying on like the one master computer somewhere. And also, their computers never hit never really hit the AI stage so either either their computers just never advanced to that point or they're trying to say that in their universe there's just there's just some roadblock that they never overcame uh, either either intentionally or unintentionally or you know or any number of other reasons but there is no strong AI in Battletech so that's also a, a thing. I'm sure. I'm sure that's probably a little bit less. This is the future of the '80s because we had AI back in the '80s, like in fiction. You know, like War Games and the Terminator were both like a thing. So we we knew all about the the dangers of don't let the computers control the nukes. But. Also, they would have also long since probably hit the limits on, I want to say it's called Moore's Law. It has to do with how frequently we double the number of transistors that will fit in a given area. And that essentially means that that, that has everything to do, with, that, that's like the building block of what computer power is, is rated as based on more transistors, more power, okay? So, uh, per, per square nanometer, whatever you're measuring it in. Uh, so, once, once we hit that uh, in the real world, because we very likely will, because if nothing else, we'll eventually hit a point where we're dealing with like subatomic particles and an electron shift is all it will take to screw something up. Uh, I have no idea how close we are to that, so I don't follow it that much. Uh, but sooner or later, we will hit the limits of that. And once we do, the only way to gain more power from a computer, we're, we're going to stop getting smaller we're going to go back to building bigger and bigger because we're going to hit the limit of, of how much we can pack into a specific area and 
and so we're going to have to go back to, instead of packing more into an area, just building more of it. And so computers are going to go back, instead of shrinking down like they did, to, uh, you know, to cell phone pocket computer size. Like, because remember folks, your, your cell phone here, your average, your, your smartphone has more computing power than what NASA was able, what NASA used to put a man on the moon, okay? Like, I don't think people really appreciate the, the, the level of, of, of technological advancement that has occurred, you know, in the last century and a half or so. It's, it's crazy to think that you know, in the span of a hundred years, you know, we, we mastered flight and then managed to put people on the moon and in space and compare that to like the rest of human history, you know, just, it's, it's all inspiring to think about is all I'm saying. So once we hit the limit on how much we can cram into a given space to increase computer power we're just going to start adding more of those spaces okay so then computers to become stronger and stronger are going to go back to becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and we might get back to the whole room size computer thing at some point in fact I'm sure we already have things like that running it's just that now instead of a bunch of tape reel computers you know it's things like whatever the current version of uh, Deep Blue is or, or whatever the more recent pseudo AI thing that they created to, to be Gary Kasparov and Chess and uh, so yeah you'll, you'll get more of those now uh, I personally don't know anywhere near enough about quantum computing to know how that's going to mess with all that. So it could be that I'm saying all this and people look at that and like, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's why Battletech's like this, you know. And then quantum computing comes along and it's like, ah, ah, don't, don't worry about that. Now now I'll be able to fit a supercomputer into, into a watch on your wrist, you know. I don't know. If you know, leave some comments down below. But yeah, so that's uh, that's a thing. So I I, I have a, an interest in those things, and that's probably one of the reasons why in D and I'm a big fan of constructs and automatons. And uh, even though I haven't had a chance to read the adventure because I don't own a copy of it, whenever I heard about the uh, I think it's Expedition to the Barrier Peaks or Return to the Barrier Peaks, something like that. Where well, the whole concept is, you're here in this fantasy setting with all your magic and everything, and then you find a crashed alien spaceship, and there's like weird mutant versions of like orcs and goblins and stuff, but also robots and everything else on board with laser weapons. And you know, I, I read things like that, and I'm like, yeah, that would be interesting to to run through and see the you know take a take a setting where like that's somewhere in the past and kind of play through the implications of that and because you know that given the, the kind of vibe it's going for you're talking like the robot's going to look like the uh, the weird Mr. Freeze robot from Logan's Run uh, or like Robbie the robot from uh, Lost in Space and like the computers are going to be the gigantic computer banks you know it's, it's going to be you know that's the way it's all set up there. The spaceship's probably gonna be like a flying saucer. You know, it's and so it's it's definitely gonna have all those things. Or you've got uh, the one game which I picked up the uh, the main book for it at Gen Con, the Dungeon Crawl Classics, uh, which is supposed to be like a I don't think it's, I don't know if it's considered an OSR game or not, but it's meant to more be, it's meant to be more like 
older editions of D and D, uh, even though it's still based on the D twenty system. So it's it's like a if I'm if I'm reading it correctly, it's like a stripped down third edition, like really stripped down. But the game itself is meant to be run more like you know first and second edition, you know, whole life's cheap kind of things. The, the goal is to get out with the gold. There's only like three alignments, like you know lawful, chaotic, and neutral, you know stuff like that. Uh, well, that same company, it's made by Goodman Games, and that same company also makes Mutant Crawl Classics, which is like a like a you know post-apocalyptic setting. Well, some of their modules are set up to be run in either game because they involve like you know your 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 Castle and Night era, and all of a sudden an alien ship crashes or. You find the remains of an alien civilization there on your planet or something or you know you're, you're the spacefaring people and you wind up on a planet with magic and swords and everything so that that interplay there you know I, that's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to look into the, the game system and I'm really hoping I get the chance to actually in, actually employ it at some point in our sessions also, just certain other things that attract, to, to make the idea sound zany and attractive to me. Like, uh, you don't really make a character. You, uh, you create, you, you use the random creation rules to make four or five characters and then run them through the meat grinder with your other players until there's only a handful of them left and then and they're at level zero and then they make it to level one and then whoever's left standing that's your character so like like that idea to me that's that's one of those this is this sounds so crazy it just might work kind of ideas now obviously for if you're a heavy role player eh, this might not be what you're after because there's none of this intricate background. Like, a lot of them are like, oh, you and the other town drunks wound up in the sacred temple of death. Like, good luck getting out. So, uh, you have that, but also, and I bought a set of these, and I really hope I get to employ them. They are scratch-off character cards. You scratch them off to get your randomly revealed stats and everything. So it's 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 crazy. That uh, at the very beginning, like dwarf, halfling, and elf are treated like classes, not races. Uh, like, kind of. At the beginning of the game, you roll to see like what your background is. It's like eighty percent of them are human, and then the rest are divided up among those three races. So you could wind up with one of them. And then if you do wind up with one of them, like, you have a, a relatively fixed advancement. Uh, whereas human, you've got options. Like, you can become a, a thief, a wizard, or whatever, you know. So, yeah, I'm hoping to run that. And once I do, maybe try to use that system for the, for the more, like, like, the Barrier Peaks kind of adventure. So... But, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's uh, about all I got on anachronistic uh, technologies and you know, just weird things like that. Uh, yeah, you know, like I said, came up from uh, re reading a discussion about how the Empire would just use facial tracking and everyone having to point out that, well, no, because they, they don't have that. They could, they should, but they don't. And, uh, which, actually, that's not all, because that does remind me of another thing, is in Star Trek, as near as I can tell, they don't have security cameras. I mean, you know, like if someone, in like Star Trek The Next Generation, someone will escape from the brig, 
And instead of just being like, okay, we'll find them on the security monitors, it's like, oh no, well, we use the ship's internal sensors, and oh, they're here. It's like, it's like, okay, but what are they doing? Like, well, we don't have eyes on them. It's like, you don't have security cameras? Or to, you know, the flagship of the Federation? So yeah, it just seems odd to me. I don't know. One of those things, like, they obviously have the technology because, you know, they've got the view screens. They, they can, obviously, and they're, you know, from Earth. Like, <laughs> photographic technology exists. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just odd to me. I don't know. Also, when you think about it, it's odd that it took until the next generation to have the replicators as we see them. Now, I think in the original series, they still had something kind of like them. But the thing is, if you have the transporter technology, you have replicator technology. You already have it. Because what the transporter does is it breaks down your molecules sends them in an energy beam to another destination where it reassembles them, okay? Well, that reassembling part, that's the replicator. You know, it's just you have, you have a fixed pattern that you can repeat, and you have some, uh, you know, some source of mass that the replicator then breaks down and then reassembles into, you know, your, your cup of Earl Grey hot or, or whatever. So, you know, it's just, it's odd that they had the one and not the other, in my opinion, because, again, like, if you have the one, you have the other. So, like, I, I, and I think this is a case where it's not necessarily true in reverse. Like, I think you could have the replicator and not the transporter. I'm pretty sure but you'd be close, like you, you'd be like 90% of the way there. Well, anyway, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my uh, commentary on uh, technology and such in sci-fi for today. Just something that caught my attention from a discussion. Started thinking about it realized that's yeah, something I could ramble on about for a while so here we are so hopefully you folks enjoyed this uh, probably see if either of the other two want to add anything to this any kind of commentary reflections maybe I'm totally wrong on something but uh, you know hit the like subscribe if you're not already subscribed comments do you like this kind of aesthetic uh, I think they call it retro futurism but I could be wrong. Uh, and I mean more like 60s and 70s than as opposed to like the 50s. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, let me know what you guys think. Uh, if there's any other, you know, big examples out there. Or if you guys just absolutely hate it and only want to see like the cutting edge. Or, or only want to see, you know, like Buck Rogers and uh, uh, older, like, old, like original Flash Gordon whatever let me know or if you're just tired of watching what seems to be like a crazy person driving around rambling let me know that too i'm not going to stop but you know let me know so anyway uh talk to you folks later